webinar right now. So welcome everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Christina Tiong, CEO of Home Nursing Foundation. And this afternoon, I'm really very pleased um, to welcome all of you to our uh, webinar series on um, home palliative care for frail elders. And today we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Cham Ziyan. She's a consultant at Tan Tok Seng Hospital with the palliative care department. And she's a visiting consultant for Dover Park Hospice. She has a keen interest in the management of patients with advanced lung failure conditions and is also an adjunct teaching faculty member for Li Kong Chien School of Medicine. Thank you so much, all of you, for spending a very precious afternoon with us at Home Nursing Foundation. I hope that this series of webinar will also help us to better care for our frail elders and patients who are homebound. And I uh, also want to take this opportunity to sell a bit of Goyo that uh, we will be conducting our first ever face-to-face um, -face, uh, CME on the 11th of November. And uh, we really hope that you will be able to join us physically on the 11th of November at um, MND building in the morning for a very exciting program with uh, Dr. Diane Myers um, from USA, who will be sharing with us about uh, palliative care uh, in, in, at the end of, uh, for, for frail elders, homebound elders. And also we will be having a panel with uh, um, many uh, home palliative care uh, clinicians who will talk through a very interesting case. And we also have Dr. Angel Lee, a veteran in uh, Singapore, who will be sharing with us on her program as well. So please mark your calendars, 11 of November, 8.30 to 12.30 p.m. Uh, uh, to join us in this uh, physical CME program that we're looking forward to. So, uh, Dr. Chum, without further ado, please uh, take it away and uh, pass the time over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christina, for a very warm welcome. I'm very interested to actually sign up for the November talk. Yeah, very good speakers. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, letting me have this opportunity to share with you a little bit more about palliative care in patients with advanced respiratory failure. So before I start, please let me share screen. Okay. All right. Any point in time, if um, there's any issues, be it connection or no, or any questions, um, please just feel free to stop me, all right? If not, uh, we can answer those questions at the end also. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, not only about health care and advanced respiratory disease, we're also going to share a little bit about um, patients with uh, severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Okay, so our contents today will be sharing a bit of background on respiratory failure and the prevalence and definition of dyspnea, the pathophysiology of dyspnea, introducing the concept of total dyspnea, I'm sure you are quite familiar with total pain and also um, what it means with total dyspnea. The comorbidities commonly seen in patients with COPD and also their management. Why we chose COPD? Because COPD is actually the most common non-cancer chronic respiratory disease. We're going to share also about dyspnea crisis and its definition and also its management. Um, not only of dyspnea, but also common symptoms like cough and secretions and also a little bit about pale care and COVID-19 pneumonia, and for example, if they are discharging home. So causes of respiratory failure can be divided into many causes. It can be non-cancer um, chronic respiratory diseases like asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, bronchiectasis. It can also be pulmonary hypertension, or it can be cancer-related, malignancy-related, or it can even be acute causes, for example, patients with pneumonia, pneumothorax, PE, um, acute pulmonary edema, or it can be other causes, for example, motor neuron disease, patients with neuropathies, myopathies, or even um, central causes like stroke. Other less common causes include, um, for example, congenital heart diseases, kyphoscoliosis, or even due to drugs. So what are the characteristics of the disease trajectory of patients with non-cancer chronic respiratory failure? These patients' prognosis are often more uncertain and more variable, and they often have symptoms that are progressive as their pulmonary function declines. They are, um, their trajectory are also interspersed by multiple acute exacerbations because of worsening of their lung disease or sometimes superimposed by pneumonia. And often they also have significant symptoms burden, including psychosocial suffering and also progressive functional loss. 
So just like to emphasize that palliative care can be introduced alongside therapies that are aimed at reducing the risk of exacerbations and also correcting the underlying abnormalities. So classification of COPD severity, we can go by the classification by looking at the FEV1 and also um, looking at their, um, how frequent do they get exacerbations and also using the MMRC and also the COPD assessment test. So prognostication in COPD, what are some of the poor prognostic factors that are associated with COPD? For example, patients that have recurrent admissions for COPD exacerbations, patients on long-term oxygen therapy that is suggested that their um, respiratory failure is more advanced, patients with heart, right heart failure, or patients that have history of ICU admissions or requiring NIV. We also had used the BOAT index to, to use in the prognostication of COPD, so what is the components of the BOAT index it includes BMI, FEV1, 6-minute walk distance, MMRC, and this actually predicts for you survivor. So what is the prevalence of dyspnea by life-limiting illnesses? So we can see that cancer and COPD patients both all have dyspnea, but patients with COPD actually do have a higher prevalence of dyspnea. So what is dyspnea? So dyspnea is a common cause for 50% of patients who are admitted to acute services, for 25% of patients seeking outpatient consultations. It's also one of the most common causes for ED admissions. Up to 50% of patients in advanced cancer also have experienced dyspnea, and up to 98% of COPD patients suffer from dyspnea. Dyspnea itself is also a potent prognostic index, so dyspnea itself has a propensity to worsen as functional status declines and often in proportion to the decline a person is experiencing. So you can see that that's why dyspnea itself is in the parameters for prognostic skills, for example, in the palliative prognostic index, the palliative prognostic score, and also the BOAT score for COPD. So we also see that dyspnea itself is the second most common cause for palliative sedation after delirium. So what is dyspnea? What um, do our patients actually describe this experience? So they can describe that there is difficulty with air movement. They feel that they have to breathe harder. They have increased effort. They feel hungry for more air. And general distress, they feel like they're suffocating. So what is the pathophysiology of dyspnea? Broadly put, there are three mechanisms that can lead to dyspnea. Increased respiratory effort needed to overcome a resistance, be it a restrictive lung disease or obstructive lung disease or patients with pleural effusion. Increased proportion of respiratory muscle required to maintain a normal workload, for example, patients that have neuromuscular weakness or patients that have cancer cachexia. Also, increased ventilatory requirements, for example, if patients are experiencing hypoxemia, high carbon dioxide levels, or metabolic acidosis or anemia. So dyspnea itself can be further divided into different types. This has actually been shared by Dr. Simon. He published it in his study in 2013. So these are the various types of dyspnea that we can classify into. Type 1, which is the triggered normal dyspnea. These are episodes that are precipitated by exertion that's comparable to a healthy person during physical activity. And the severity is strongly related to the level of exertion. Overall, this type of dyspnea shows lower severity scores for breathlessness. There is also a type 2 kind of dyspnea, which is triggered and predictable, commonly like what we classify as exertional dyspnea. They're triggered by activities, for example, climbing up stairs, and they are predictable severity. It's a gradual increase and decrease of breathlessness severity. So this can be coped, for example, by avoidance of activity, pacing, or using of walking aid for energy conservation. Type 3 kind of dyspnea is triggered, but very unpredictable. So there's no relationship between the level of exertion and the severity of breathlessness. Often it's a quick onset and severe intensity, unpredictable and associated with anxiety. There's also a type 4 dyspnea that is non triggered, attack like. So it presents like an attack out of the blue without any warning. It's associated with intense feelings of panic, anxiety, and loss of control. These are often a greater intensity kind of dyspnea severity. 
And that's also type 5 dyspnea, which is more wave-like, quite specific to COPD, that it gradually builds up to a maximum severity breathlessness, then wins off to normal. And patients usually have no means to interrupt this wave-like cause. So episodic dyspnea is defined by a significant clinical aggravation of dyspnea in patients with continuous dyspnea or occurring intermittently without constant breathlessness. So you can see that breathlessness episodes are often frequent and they are described that it can occur one to five times a day and each episode lasts less than 10 minutes, but they are of moderate to severe intensity and they're often associated with feelings of anxiety, panic, and the fear to die. So the emotional response to this episodic breathlessness is usually panic, and this will then lead to a vicious cycle of triggering breathlessness itself. So you can see that this is actually the challenges we see so often um, in incident pain. However, the nature of episodic breathlessness means that the conventional oral opiates that we give will not be effective in elevating these symptoms given its fast onset, unpredictability, and short duration of episodic dyspnea. So um, often patients you know, with pain, we can manage with opioids, with interventions, but patients with dyspnea, um, we, we not only have to use opioids, but also a multi multidisciplinary approach to manage. So for patients that are not able to share with us how severe the dyspnea is, we can use the respiratory distress observation skill to look at the non-verbal cues of dyspnea. So just like in pain, it, what we look at is the, we can use, um, for example, if they are using any of their abdomen to breathe, moves in on inspiration or when there's any accessory respiratory masses used, uh, we observe as any grunting sound at the end of breathing, and observing there's any nasal flaring or any frightened look. Other things that we can look at is the heart rate and the respiratory rate. So the American Thoracic Society also adopted this model of total dyspnea in its definition. So it defines that dyspnea is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that has a qualitatively distinct sensation that varies in intensity and this experience actually derives from interactions among multiple physiological, psychological, social, and environmental factors. And this will then induce a secondary physiological and behavioral response. So what is this concept of total dyspnea? So as we have seen that dyspnea itself is a complex interaction of signals from the brain, lungs, chest wall, and airways. So these neuronal signals are then in turn processed and influenced by behavioral, cognitive, contextual, and environmental factors. This will then lead to the unique interpretation and reaction to the symptom of dyspnea within a patient's own framework of history, experience, values, and beliefs. So this model will then translate well to the recognized total pain model to the realm of dyspnea, and this addresses that patient experiences of this symptom is in the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual domains. So this will actually provide a framework for us to give an approach that will be not only pharmacological, but also the non-pharmacological methods. So this, um, what, 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 is, what is this self-perpetuating cycles in chronic dyspnea? It actually shows that, um, that not only does the breathing um, involved, but there are also other um, disciplines that's involved. So this breathing thinking functioning model was actually proposed by the Breathlessness Intervention Service in the UK. So this framework actually helped us to conceptualize the complex nature of dyspnea. It highlights the three dominant domains, which is cognitive, psychological, and behavioral reactions that will interact to intensify the experience of breathlessness. So for respiratory domain, breathlessness itself will induce a dysfunctional breathing pattern that will increase the work of breathing and reduce ventilatory efficiency. For the cognitive um, domain, breathlessness will then lead to an individual paying excessive attention to this feeling of dyspnea, and this will actually trigger the memories of negative experiences during their previous attacks of breathlessness, with accompanying feelings of anxiety, panics, and also thoughts of impending death. As for the physical component, because of severe breathlessness, our patients are often very scared to have activity and exertion. So this actually leads to activity avoidance. And this one will make them more self-isolated 
and homebound and greater reliance on others and assistance from others, resulting in consequent deconditioning of their limbs, their chest wall, and also their accessory muscles. So this actually perpetuates a downward vicious cycle. So um, this diagram here really shows this interplay of um, different domains in the experience of dyspnea. So not only is it a physical component, but there are also other domains that we should look at. If, for example, whether there's any psycho psychological existential distress, we have to look into um, anxiety, depression, panic. We also do have to look into common symptoms, for example, insomnia, positivism, constipation and also um, uh, other social factors, for example, social isolation, and also their function. So again, this diagram actually highlights the importance of the concept of total dyspnea. So what are the common... So moving forward now, we're going to cover on the common um, non-cancer respiratory disease, which would be COPD. So what are some of the common comorbidities that are also present in patients with COPD? This can be divided into three components, physical, psychological, and social. So physical components, we know that patients with um, chronic um, lung disease, they often have experiences of also reflux, GERD, also have history of uh, BPH, which of one of our COPD patients are the elderly male. So they also do have uh, prostate hypertrophy problems. And also patients, they have concomitant comorbidities, for example, ischemic heart disease. And often our patients um, have constipation problems, postural hypotension. And this is because our patients with COPD often have, um, might have repeated causes of steroids. And this actually leads to um, adrenal insufficiency. And also we know that in COPD, because it's a chronic disease, they also have um, chronic um, ataxia and, and also malnutrition. So the other psychological components that we're looking at is to screen for anxiety depression, and also insomnia. And also for the social component, we also have to look out for any caregiver stress because often these patients with non-cancer, chronic respiratory disease, they have this disease for many, many years. And um, we know that because of their respiratory disease, they're not able to go out to work, they have financial problems, they have social isolation. So this actually adds on to the layer of caregiver stress. So moving on to the management of constipation. So this might seem like, uh, why, why is there this emphasis on talking about constipation? Because if this problem can actually, um, this is a simple activity that can actually um, be difficult for patients with a chronic respiratory disease because they actually have to strain to pass motion. And it's the times when they strain, they actually have to hold their breath. And this is going to be very difficult. So um, oftentimes, this will have constipation and impacted stools may actually lead to what we know as spurious diarrhea, whereby only the liquid stools can bypass around the impacted stools and flow out as, like, like, as if it's like liquid stools diarrhea. So often, these um, patients may actually tell their doctors that uh, I'm having watery stools and they are prescribed, for example, um, medications like uh, loperamide to stop the stools stop the loose tools, but this actually worsens their constipation. So how we can um, be, I mean, apart from doing an abdominal x-ray to see if there's any severe fecal infection, simple digital rectal examination also can, also can let us um, have this suspicion. So for example, when we do the digital rectal examination, if the rectal wall, you can feel that you can't really feel it, it feels that it's dilated, it's very cavernous, then this is actually highly suggestive that it's other stools that are impacted higher up and this actually requires clearance of the stools instead of uh, prescribing um, medications to stop the diarrhea. So not only um, constipation, our patient have to strain to pass motion, often constipation itself also can lead to difficulty in passing urine. So they might tell you that they have poor urine flow, they feel that there's incomplete voiding of urine, they often tell you that I have to wake up many times at night to pass urine or even dribbling at the end of urination. So as you can see from the diagram for patients that have a lot of stool infection, it can really um, uh, obstruct the um, urinary outflow. And this actually leads to urinary retention. So that's why this um, simple symptom actually can be easily screened and treated and managed. And this will very much improve their quality of life. 
So moving on to a management of GERD. So long-standing breathlessness is associated with indigestion, gastric acid reflux. So symptoms of gastric acid reflux that the patients might share with us is that they feel that I get abdominal bloatedness, my appetite is poor, I get frequent burping, I get a meat chest burning sensation. So when gastric acid reflux affects the throat, patients also may manifest with itchy dry cough that's worse, especially when they're resting supine or after their meals. So what are some of the medications that can help gastric reflux would be like a Gaviscon, an MMT that we can give three times a day uh, with warm water. And other gentle reminders that we can use, for example, is to avoid eating before sleeping, avoiding smoking after meals, popping your head up at night when you sleep with one pillow, and also reducing the intake of alcohol, caffeine, avoiding spicy sour food, and also taking small multiple meals per day. So again, this diagram actually shows the vicious cycle of constipation and breathlessness and how they interplay. So we can see that often our patients, um, if they have constipation, they will also might have concomitant difficulties in passing urine, they have nocturia. Nocturia will affect their sleep. And then when not sleeping well at night, they get anxiety. This actually exacerbates their breathlessness experience. At the same time, um, patients often also have gastric acid reflux and this might result in nighttime coughing. Again, this results in poor sleep, anxiety, and also worsens the experience of breathlessness. Hence, this diagram actually highlights the importance of screening and also managing these common symptoms. How about the vicious cycle of anxiety and breathlessness? So often when they are anxious and panic, they will also get a worsening breathlessness. And when they are breathless, they will have breathing that is shallow, that is ineffective. And then this can lead to their oxygenation levels to drop. And then this will result in chest discomfort and add to further anxiety and panic. How about the vicious cycle of breathlessness and physical inactivity? So for example, if a patient gets admitted for a pneumonia, they get breathless. Because of breathlessness, they then refuse rehabilitation. Because of this, they actually get weakening of muscles, decrease in mobility, and then they get discharged home with a functional that is poorer than when they went into it. But they become more homebound. And when they are homebound, they start to have social isolation. They lose their contact with their family and friends. And then they get a sense of loneliness and helplessness. So when they experience breathlessness, then what they will do is that they will actually call, off, call for ambulance to send them into the hospital. So this actually will lead to repeated in and out admissions via ED and also hospitalizations. So dyspnea and anxiety. So it is really not surprising that there are a lot of high prevalences of panic attacks and anxiety disorders amongst our patients with chronic dyspnea. So um, in this study, it reports that patients often have feelings of fear, helplessness, and also vulnerability. So the prevalence of generalized anxiety can even range from 10 to 30%, and the rate can even go up to 70% for patients who experience panic attacks. And also 10 to 40% actually have concomitant depression also. Hence, we can see that this near itself really is a complex symptom that would evoke strong emotion reactions and these negative emotional states can also modulate the respiratory sensory thresholds and thereby intensify the perception of dyspnea. So we also see that studies performed on COPD subjects also find that measures of anxiety and depression correlate with impact quality of life, poor physical and social functioning, and also a higher mortality. So what do we do for our patients that have dyspnea? So we can come up with individualized crisis care plan. So this can be divided into before the crisis happens and also during the crisis. So pre-crisis intervention, we do early identification for a more vulnerable group that will benefit from palliative intervention. So management should be very patient-centric and multidisciplinary in input. So there's also the importance of early advanced care planning, frequent revisitation of end-of-life care plans in alignment with different phases of the disease trajectory. Crisis intervention is also very important that people are able to recognize this new. 
And the key to respond to actually resolving the crisis is just empowering the responder with an individualized crisis management plan, which will include the use of prepared emergency symptom control medications. So upon access to medical help and palliative services, the guidelines also recommends effective communication between the healthcare providers and also the involved caregivers. So the discussion itself will have to discuss on issues on prognostication, treatment options, including time-limited trials where appropriate, as well as where can the patient be best cared for. Last of all, it's also essential that there's care coordination between different, um, different disciplines and also um, in different settings. For example, the hospital working closely with the hospice home care or, or, the, or daycare working closely with the hospital respiratory physicians or the palliative physician so that we can have a seamless transfer and continuity of medical care. So what is um, crisis? What is dyspnea crisis? Okay. So dyspnea crisis, again, is another concept that is um, published in the American Thoracic Society guidelines. So it is rather similar to pain crisis that we are rather similar with. So it is defined as a sustained, severe resting breathing discomfort that occurs in patients with advanced, life-limiting illness and overwhelms the patient and caregiver's ability to achieve symptom relief. So it often occurs suddenly, is poorly responsive to immediate relief and often necessitates um, the consideration for ICU utilization. However, we know that prognosis generally be poor. So this is a template for a dyspnea crisis management plan. So we can name it using this acronym COMFORT. But this itself can be actually a very powerful resource when dyspnea crisis hits a family unit. So C stands for a call for help. Using a calming voice and approach, observe closely and access dyspnea for ways to respond. So medications that can be tried, for example, if patients have standby oral morphine, or if they have any standby anxiolytics like alprazolam or lorazepam, pointing the fan to the face also has been shown to reduce the experience of breathlessness. Oxygen therapy also can be used. Also to reassure and to use relaxation training techniques and also time the interventions to see whether it's helping in the relief of dyspnea. Then we reaccess again and repeat again. So let's talk about the management of dyspnea. Let's talk about the pharmacological management first. So the first step in managing dyspnea is the recognition of its etiology. And this can be due to airway edema from pneumonia, lymphangitis carcinomatosis in patients with lung cancer or patients with pleural effusions. So treatment should be directed at treating the underlying cause and also the mechanism leading to dyspnea. So other things that we're going to discuss in this talk will also be the, the use of systemic opioids, anxiolytics, antidepressants. So again, this, this um, flowchart actually shows um, disease-specific treatment. So for example, for patients with pneumonia, giving a course of antibiotics might help to relieve breathlessness. For patients that are in exacerbation, they can use um, nebulizers. For patients that have pleural effusion, we do drainage. And sometimes we observe and see whether this helps with the relief of breathlessness. So how do opioids work in patients with dyspnea? So the mode of action is that it works by decreasing the central perception of dyspnea, decreasing the ventilatory response to hypercarbia and low oxygen, reduce the work of breathing, for example, minute ventilation, reduce the experience of anxiety and pain, and also itself has a phenodilatory effect for heart failure and angina. So this one is a common... Uh, Patients often often have misconceptions about uh, opioids use. So this is um, a slide that just shows the facts and also the myths uh, and how we can address these misconceptions. So often you will hear your patients telling you, uh, I'm, 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 not too, I'm very worried to take morphine because I'm worried that I'll get addicted to morphine. So how we can explain it is that we let them know that morphine is um, prescribed to help you relieve your breathlessness. And often the dose that we're giving is low dose. If you follow your doctor's prescription, you will not get addicted to morphine. Okay, so the concept of addiction is actually very different um, for morphine that's prescribed for medical indications. 
when sometimes patients will tell you that they are worried that I will become dependent on morphine and that next time when I really need it, it wouldn't be effective. So we also can reassure our patients that uh, we will adjust the morphine dosages according to their condition. For example, if the condition improves, we may even reduce the dosages of the morphine. Some patients are worried that morphine will hasten death. So we can let them know that appropriate doses will keep them comfortable and does not shorten survival. And we will start low and slowly, slowly adjust upwards in a safe and effective manner. Some patients also will feedback to you that they're worried that, you no, know, um, I'm not dying. Uh, why do I need morphine? Yeah. So we let them know that morphine uh, is not only a drug that's used in patients at the end of life, itself is an excellent medication to treat moderate to severe pain and breathlessness. Thus, opioid hasten death. So there have been multiple studies that have been done that unanimously has shown that it's safe for patients with dyspnea at the end of life. It's not associated with decreased survival. It's not associated with respiratory with suppression. Also, does not do alterations to the arterial blood gas. So proper titration has been shown to relieve dyspnea without hypercarbia or hypoxemia. So treatment of this near in the American College of Chest Physicians, they also have published a statement that says of our patients with advanced lung or heart disease, it is actually um, appropriate to actually use opioids to help relieve the intensity of breathlessness and an opiate should be dosed and titrated for relief of this near in the individual patient and the goal is to palliate this near. So for patients that have anxiety issues, you can see that we also will commonly prescribe some benzodiazepines. So it has been postulated that how it works is by suppressing hypoxia or hypercapnia ventilatory responses, also altering the emotional response to this near. So even though there's widespread clinical usage in our daily practice, the research evidence for angiolytics are weak. We also know the importance of uh, management of insomnia in our patients with chronic respiratory disease. So we can also send by, for example, some lorazepam at night. Lorazepam itself not only can be used at bedtime for insomnia, it itself can also be used for patients with panic attacks. For example, it can be administered sublingually at 0.5 mg. Other drugs that we can use for anxiolytic is also our prazolam, that is a short ending anxiolytic. So, for example, we can prescribe it at 0 0.125 mg PRN up to 8 hourly. Despite our understanding of how emotions are so important in the perception and response to dyspnea, the use of antidepressants have not consistently shown clinical benefits. And this may be because of the longer onset of antidepressants or the fact that its side effects becomes increasingly intolerable in a patient that is deteriorating physically day by day. In recent years, there's also been interest in the use of metazepine, uh, which is a uh, noradrenergic non specific serotonergic antidepressant. So it was been postulated as a serotonin may actually modulate the respiratory function an impact on the areas of the brain that is relating to fear and anxiety, which is active during the experience of breathlessness. So in this study, they gave 15 mg for two weeks to five months, and all these cases actually reported less breathlessness and able to do more. And also, it also helps with anxiety, panic, appetite, and sleep. How about the equally important non-pharmacological aspect in the management of this near? So I think success is also most likely when as many of the patient's individual dyspnea stressors and concomitant symptoms are actively screened and being managed. So for COPD patients, you can see um, there's quite a bit of evidence based in non-pharmacological management. There's pulmonary rehabilitation. There's also neuroelectrical muscle stimulation that has been shown that over six to eight weeks, it can help patients uh, but not capable of exercise. So they will put these electrodes over the quadriceps. And these studies have shown that it improves dyspnea, muscle strength, and performance in daily activities. Other evidence is chest wall vibration, walking aids for energy conservation, um, post-deep breathing techniques. 
So this can actually decrease the respiratory rate, increase the vital capacity, improving gas exchange, handheld fan and shut earlier on, and so the importance of advanced care planning. Other things that are also important to look into and also to prescribe to our patients are, for example, having dietitian review for nutritional supplements and also getting our social worker to ensure that our patients can afford this um, continued usage of nutritional supplements and also getting our PTOT team to teach our patients on energy conservation strategies. So how does handheld fan work? So the mode of action is that as it blows on the face, it actually activates the V2 and V3 of the facial nerve. And um, this actually has a study that was done. They actually had a fan that was blowing at the face and at the leg, and it shows that patients with the fan blowing at the face had a significant reduction in this near score. So this is really a simple thing that can be done at home for patients that have experiencing uh, acute worsening of breathlessness attack. We can advise them to open up their windows, to switch on their fan, be a standing fan or a handheld fan to do per sleep breathing. For patients that have oxygen, we can ask them to turn up their oxygen supply. And um, for those patients that have inhalers, we can ask them to use their resting inhalers. If still not better, we can ask them to use their standby opioids. And if still not better, they can use their standby antibiotics. So this is actually a step-by-step -step instruction that we can give to our patients and empower them. How about management of cough? that is a common symptom. So let's first understand a little bit more about the cough pathway. So a cough reflex can be triggered by irritants or, or any inflammatory or mechanical changes in the airways. So we can see that there's a feedback from the sensory nerve receptors in our lungs, all the way from by the vagus nerve into the brain stem and into the central cough center. And this will then result in an efferent cough response. So it's important to evaluate what is the trigger of cough and see if these causes are reversible, if still consistent with the goals of care and prognosis. So if feasible, treatment should always be directed at the underlying cause, for example, uh, pneumonia or for patients that might have um, gastric esophageal reflux disease, we can treat it with our um, omeprazole and also for patients that have aspiration, we can also treat it. So for symptomatic therapy, can still be given while waiting for acute therapy to work. And so sometimes our patients also have chronic cough that's also not amenable to treatment. So what is the definition of chronic cough? Chronic cough is defined as more than eight weeks. And often we will see that there's often a central sensitization component already of the cough reflex in the brain stem. So management of chronic cough, there hasn't been any medical therapies for cough that's uniformly effective. Opioids and neuromodulators such as carbapentin might be helpful in some and can be considered empirically. Of course, we also do have to treat the potential causes of cough, for example, GERD, ACE inhibitors used, post-nasal drip should still be identified and addressed. So opioids for cough. So commonly when we have patients, we can prescribe them with uh, cough suppressants and we know that, um, for example, um, some home remedies like honey, how does it work? Actually, the mechanism of action is not known. So some of the authors hypothesize that it acts as a protective barrier to the sensitive receptors in the throat that it heightens the cough reflex. And uh, for opioids, how they work is that they are centrally acting and they work by suppressing the brainstem cough center through mu and kappa opioid receptor agonism. However, again, there's also no strong evidence that one opioid has superior efficacy for cough relief. So, um, for example, for patients that have a non-cancer chronic respiratory disease with cough, we can prescribe um, procodine, codeine, or even dextromethorphan. Gabapentin for refractory chronic cough also has been used. So I have also consulted uh, respiratory physicians for their experience on this. I think for them, they also do share that it's a hit and miss. For some patients, it does work. For some patients, it does not. So in this particular RCT, they, com they compared the use of gabapentin versus placebo for the treatment of refractory chronic cough. And it shows that gabapentin did improve cough-specific quality of life. But of course, we have to see whether the side effects are tolerable, which are often somnolence, fatigue, sleepiness. 
how about management of secretions? Causes of secretions is often because of increased production of respiratory mucus present um, in our patients with chronic lung diseases, also patients with cancer, and associated with cough inefficiency because of muscle weakness and also poor coordination. So again, the interventions and management of secretions is dependent on the patient's goals of care and also the patient's condition. For example, if it's a reversible condition, for example, for a patient with pneumonia, we still can try to promote expectoration expector, 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 and also increase mucociliary clearance and conduction of secretions in the upper airways and also improving cough effectiveness. So this can be done, for example, with the use of mucolytics like Fomacil, chest physiotherapy. But this above measures might not be very suitable for our patients in palliative care, especially in their more advanced stages where they're more frail. So we can see that chest, physio chest physiotherapy, suctioning, they're commonly done in the hospital setting. However, we do need to be able to recognize that suctioning itself is often uncomfortable. Itself also has own complications. For example, um, it can be traumatic. Patients can have bloody secretions. And uh, it can also um, uh, induce a lot of discomfort and fear in our frail patients. So in our palliative care setting, suctioning indication must be very clear and be done with caution. Treatment of secretions in dying patients. So I think the number one key is to check how much are we uh, putting in, how much are we actually putting in, in the sense of the drip. So we do need to reduce artificial hydration. Sometimes if there's already a lot of secretions, we'll even stop drip and explain to the family that patient is in terminal phase. Uh, repositioning, putting them in the lateral position, explanation to family is very important. Because, um, for example, if we do stop drip um, to our family, they will feel that um, their, their loved ones will actually um, be dying, dehydration. So we do have to address all these common concerns. And the medications that we use uh, commonly is hyoscine butabomite, which is bascopan. Other drugs that we use are like glycopyrrolate. And if we are working in a home care setting, we can also try oral um, sublingual atropine drops, which is your atropine 1% eye drops that is administered sublingually into the mouth. Other times, we, some patients, it has been reported that they can use copolamine patches, but again, also depends on whether it has um, copolamine patches available in your institution. Other studies also have reported the use of octreotide in secretions management. But commonly, the drugs that we use for the treatment of secretions are vascopine and glycopyrrolate and atropine. So what are the doses of these medications? For example, for subcut vascopine, the maximum dose um, in tartoxin institution is 120 mg per day, even though the literature has gone up to higher doses, all right? But again, we use 20 mg PRN four hourly. And we see that the patients are observed that, you know, we measure their heart rate, their tachycardic heart rate more than 100. We will tend to use glycopyrrolate because anecdotally we can see that glycopyrrolate does induce lesser tachycardia effects. Glycopyrrolate dose is dose at 0.4 mg subheart, PRN 4 hourly to a maximum dose of 2.4 mg per day. So we are moving on to the last section of my talk, which is severe COVID 19 pneumonia. So we can see that. Um, for COVID-19 symptoms, it actually commonly um, patients will have fever, cough, dyspnea, fatigue. And um, what is its clinical cause? Uh, so severe cases um, progress to acute respiratory distress symptoms, septic shock, coagulopathy, and metabolic acidosis at day 7 to 10. So these patients, be, how do, for patients with COVID, how do we actually um, divide them into the low-risk group and to the high-risk group of disease progression? So for the low-risk group, uh, for patients that are younger, less than 30, no comorbidities, do not have breathlessness, they have normal oxygenation, and also normal chest x-ray, lab works, they're also reassuring. For the high-risk group, they're often more uh, more senior, they have chronic comorbidities, 
And if they also present with worrisome clinical features, for example, they tell you that they have breathlessness, they are breathing faster, they have um, hypoxemia, they require oxygen, they have chest x-ray changes, and also if they have worrisome laboratory results. So COVID-19 severity uh, can be classified. So as long as you're on oxygen, even if it's one, two liters, you're also defined as a severe COVID-19. We also do use in the hospital the ICERIC, for, ICERIC mortality score that will uh, determine the risk of a mortality. Score A score of seven is actually a higher risk of 11% for mortality. So this is a Cochrane re uh, review. They look at the interventions for palliative symptom control in COVID-19 patients. So this study itself has four uncontrolled retrospective cohort studies. And in it, it lists that the common symptoms that patients with COVID-19 experience is dyspnea, delirium, anxiety, pain, secretions, nausea, cough. And the treatment that was prescribed were opioids, anticholinergics, and benzodiazepines. And all these medications are shown to provide symptoms relief. So for patients that have COVID-19 uh, pneumonia, I would say that the management of this near is actually rather similar to what we have shared earlier on, including the management of secretions. Just that what we have observed um, by looking after these patients with COVID-19 pneumonia is that often um, they decline uh, at a much faster rate. And also often the titration of medications also will be in a faster manner um, to, to achieve symptom control than those patients uh, without uh, that are non-COVID pneumonia. So another, um, another aspect about COVID-19 patients and that is unique to them is that um, because this uh, infectious disease, so often there's um, terminal discharge itself is also um, slightly more tricky. So what we mean by terminal discharge is that if we think of the prognosis, it's going to be short days. And uh, we have identified a dedica dedicated caregiver. And also the household members are accepting of the risk of exposure, making sure that there's no vulnerable family members living in the same household. And that there's sufficient time notice for the home care team to be informed about this potential terminal discharge and that they are agreeable to help and can support this terminal discharge. And we often see a terminal discharge has to be conducted on a weekday within office hours. So what are some of the um, criteria that we say that is, we would not recommend for terminal discharge will be those patients that are intubated on uh, NIV support, patients that are very symptomatic, patients that are too unstable for transfer, and for patients and family that are unable to finance this high cost of this TD because um, there's actually uh, a lot of logistics involved. For example, uh, the ambulance, oxygen renter, um, and also getting disinfection. So often these rates are higher than they are for the non-COVID-19 TDs. Another important um, thing to note is that if our patients, um, uh, if our patients, uh, they, they go home after terminal discharge, uh, if they have COVID-19 pneumonia, or for patients that are certified to have, uh, they tested positive for COVID-19 pneumonia and if they pass away at home, and if you are the GP sending out the death, you have to certify if they are still infectious. So this is a guideline for patients that are tested positive on the COVID-19 PCR test and are still under isolation at time of demise. For patients that are tested positive on COVID-19 PCR within 14 days of date of demise, and also for those that have ART that are positive within 14 days of date of demise and with no known negative ART. And also for those who are close contact with person with COVID-19 in the seven days preceding demise. So this is a flow chart that actually summarizes what was shared earlier on that will help medical professionals to determine a disease person is still infectious for COVID-19 in the community. Another thing also is that funeral arrangements for COVID-19. So we also have to check for approved lists of funeral service providers under the NCID website. 
Also, they let them know our fam patient's family know that embalming will not be allowed and the coffin has to be sealed without window if they are still infectious. And wakes are also a shorter duration. Okay, so I'm now at the end of my presentation and we're in good time for questions. I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Chiam. I think that was a very comprehensive coverage of not just uh, uh, dyspnea, but all the other uh, holistic areas that we should look into, especially when caring for patients at the end of life, regardless of you know what is their presenting symptoms. I think it's a good um, coverage of what we should pay attention to as well. Uh, also, the psychosocial aspects are not to be neglected and the non-pharmacological interventions are also very useful in the home setting. So I think this is a best uh, uh, appropriate moment for us to raise any questions. You can do so by uh, muting yourself or you can also uh, type in the chat if you are shy to speak out. Maybe just to get a sense of um, how uh, you feel these measures are applicable to your patients. Maybe if you can uh, respond by typing in a chat group on a, a scale of 1 to 10, how, how much do you think your patients can uh, benefit from some of these interventions that has been covered? 10 meaning that it's totally applicable because you do have a lot of patients with dyspnea and, and that you can actually do these interventions because they are very feasible. And uh, please do indicate in the chat if, if you find that this is applicable uh, for your patients. Okay, I think the, the, the chat is very, very quiet today. Wow, okay, there's a 10. Um, yes, wow. Okay, thanks for your response. So this is a very uh, useful talk for us because uh, for all the clinicians who are looking after end-of-life patients, um, we may not have also the opportunity to take note of all these latest uh, findings and possible applications. So we do have a couple more minutes before the webinar ends. So I, I would encourage you to raise any comments or questions. So meanwhile, I, I do have a question regarding terminal discharge for this year uh, for COVID. I think other than for COVID, the very high charges associated with a terminal discharge would also apply to patients who are being terminally discharged for various other conditions, especially related to respiratory disease. I mean, the rental of the oxygen, the cost of uh, certification of death at home, and also the ambulance. Are all these um, something that in the hospital, uh, you would advise your patients before you you know, plan for the terminal discharge and and hand, hand them uh, with a with a transfer note to the home palliative care. That's right. Uh, yeah. So That's how, right. how, how does it work? Yeah, maybe I can bring you through one. Um, so um, for example, um, so for example, I have a patient with bronchiectasis that is very frail elderly, admitted for pneumonia and um and she's still not improving. She is very frail, not eating much. So we know that the time is actually short. She's on two liters oxygen. So some things that we have to be prepared for, of course, would be number one, the home equipment. So oxygen concentrator, because she requires the oxygenation. Um, other things sometimes that family may want to get is hospital bed for easy nursing care. And then um, next step will be identifying um, whose house should be returning to the patient and who will be the full-time caregiver. So we say that we not only need one, we need at least two so that they can actually take turns. And um, after that, we also have to explain to them what actually a terminal discharge entails. It means it's going home to pass away and um, it can be very stressful um, practically. So um, they not only 
then the so for example, if the caregiver is going to be a family, a loved one, um, for example, a daughter, and also the and and, and emotionally, not only a daughter, you are also now putting on another hat. You have a role of a doctor and a nurse, and when when patients are comfortable, that's all right. But when the patients become very uh, symptomatic, for example, they become more breathless, we have to let them know that they have to access the symptoms and they have to give medication. If the patient can still can take orally, they can take oral morphine. Uh, for some patients, maybe they're on a fentanyl patch. Um, but if some patients, they are too drowsy to take any oral medications, then we have to let them know that they have to go for caregiver training before the terminal discharge for subcutaneous medications uh, administration. So, um, for example, we often explain to them it's as if it's like an insulin injection kind, uh, which is under the skin due to the fat. So, we had to let them know that this, has, this is what they will go through. It will be the first line and that the hospice home care is there to support. Yeah. So, it's letting them know so that they have mental preparation and see whether they are ready to accept this or not. Mm. Um, because it's very stressful and if they feel that they're not up to it, then we will often tell them that it's all right. We can look after them, our loved ones, in the hospital setting, or we can trans transit them to uh, transfer them to our inpatient hospice. All right. Then um, other things. Um, so for example, if they feel that yes, um, I'm ready for this, I want to bring my loved one home. Then uh, apart from um this uh preparation of home equipment, caregiver training for basic nursing care, oral care, subcutaneous medications, injection. Um, other things they can look in is also, uh, for example, engaging private nursing to help them if they feel that they need the support also. Um, after this is that the, um, the team, the medical team uh, and the nursing team will also have liars with the hospice home care team. To, because often if the terminal discharge means that the prognosis is very short. So we do hope that the hospice home care team can go in the day of terminal discharge. So mm -hmm. we do work very closely with the hospice home care team to make sure that they can go in on that day. So um, it's very close update. So for mm -hmm. example, maybe the day before, uh, even a few days before, we can give a uh, hospice home care team to see if they can support. And then on the day itself, we'll give that handover that patient has left the hospital. And also any further updates, for example, on what medications, if the patient's on infusions, so that they know and that they're really on standby to receive the patient at home. So this is how we work closely so that the patient's symptoms are, min are minimized. Yeah. Okay. So typically it will be like maybe the prognosis is about not you more than three days. or two, it's three or four days. Yes, short days. Then yeah. this whole uh, uh, transfer will take place. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But there's a lot of prep work. I I I I can imagine yeah. that it will be a uh, hard to kind of prepare so many things for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. other things is that um for subcutaneous medications administration, sometimes we do put uh, a subcutaneous cannula. Mm. Um okay. uh, yeah, and then the we will pre-fill stringers with the medications that are clearly labeled um the drug medication, its frequency and also the indication. So okay. that, that the family yeah, okay. members can access and then just easily administer the medication through the subcutaneous port. Yeah, okay. instead of direct injection each time. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So there okay. are a couple of questions in the yeah. chat room and I think it's, it's good if we can address them. Uh, one is uh, regarding sub-Q bascopan. How often is the heart rate raised due to the medication? Okay, give me a moment now. Uh, oh, okay. How often is the heart? Uh, so, um, hi Don. Thanks for the very good question. So often our patients um that require that has secretions um are often very unwell, be it with an acute infection or if not they are terminally ill, and their heart rate naturally would be tachycardic already. So subcutaneous bascopan um it can it can result in some tachycardia, but oftentimes they already have some underlying um sickness that might actually predispose them also. But I will still use it uh, for patients if they have indication. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other question relates to the prescription of bromhexin as a mucolytic. Why is it rarely used? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yes, I think in the hospital setting, we rarely use bromhexin. Our first go to, to go drug for mucolytic is still Flumacil. Um, I, I would say it's a practice. It's a physician um, preference. Um, it can still be used from bromhexin. Yeah.
I'm looking at Pris, uh, Priscilla's um, question. Mm. Uh, in terms of secretion management, when do you know whether mucolytics are better or for patients who's at end of life or should be prescribed with other medications like Bascopan? especially when it's a key report sticks to them. That's a very good question. Yeah. So often I also ask uh, myself this. So um, for patients, if they are at the end of life, I would, at the end of life, patients are actually very frail and weak already, which means that their uh, cough reflex in a, um, is very weak. So usually I would stop the mucolytics and I would go for my anti-secretory medications. Thanks. Um, Kenji? ERD cause bronchiectasis and mm -hmm. does COPD cause GRD uh, constipation or vice versa or mm. are they just associated? Mm. So um, thanks Winifred for the very good question. So uh, I would say that GERD does not cause bronchiectasis just that um, the chronic lung diseases, chronic dyspnea are often associated with patients with reflux symptoms. Yeah. So, um, does COPD cause GERD, constipation, or vice versa? Uh, again, I wouldn't say that COPD is um, it's a causation for GERD or constipation, just that these uh, symptoms of GERD and constipation are commonly associated in patients uh, or prevalent in patients with COPD. Okay? Uh, last two questions. Should we consider procodine as an alternative opioid for opioid uh, avoidant patient? Okay. Thanks, thanks Tekwang, for this very good question. So, um, for patients that are opioid phobic avoidant, I will have to see what is this indication that I'm prescribing uh, alternative opioid. So I suppose if a patient is um, morphine phobic, yes, we can use alternative opioid, but I would not use procodine um, because procodine itself is made up of uh, promethazine and codeine. All right. So we do have to see what is this opioid for. So for example, if it's for pain relief, then it will not be um, it will not be appropriate. Uh, and if it's for breathlessness itself, uh, also not so. So most likely, I would choose an alternative opioid that is, um, maybe I can use a fentanyl patch, for example, even in a home care setting. Because of course, a fentanyl patch, we should use it only in the, when we have a good control of the symptoms, then we use a long acting. But sometimes in a home care setting, you might find that you have limited options, yeah? So um, I would use an alternative opioid, but not procodine. Yeah. Other things you know, that are available is like oxycodone. But again, I know that it also has uh, restrictions in who can prescribe. Yeah. And I think the last question relates to the effect of a mini aspiration in weak patients. What? Any advice? The effect of mini aspirations. Oh, okay. Yes. Very good question. So for example, for our patients, maybe with um uh, with stroke disease or patients that has advanced dementia or NGT feeding, you find that they're very prone to recurrent aspiration. So any way to reduce this is often, um, I think it's really a lot of education and telling the family that even the NGT, it does not minimize aspiration risk and that they're at risk. And that what we can do to minimize is to prop their head up, you know, uh, prop their head up when we're nursing them, when they're resting. And other things is also looking at the milk feeds to make sure that, um, that it's not too high volume, all right? Even though the aspirate, the NGT aspirates might be all right. So raised heart rate, Don is saying that raised heart rate is rare to be a limiting factor for this. Yes, you're right, Don. So the, okay, I think there's one last question regarding constipation, the management of constipation, lactulose and senna does not seem to work as well as supp suppository dalcolex in clearing the bowels because they are quite weak and they can't really push. Uh, is, is that also uh, what you experience? Absolutely, Priscilla. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. So, you know, um, for lactulose senna, you know, when we give very high doses, we increase the dose from 10 mil TDS to higher, it might not work. So sometimes what we can do is that we can change the osmotic laxative, the lactulose to folex, folex uh, sachet, so they just dissolve the powder into like 250, 300 meals. And we can prescribe four legs to maybe one sachet BD twice a day. Senna cord, we can increase to two tap BD, TDS. Uh, yeah, so these medications can be switched and increased. 
And I agree with you that suppository methods are often the fastest way. And I feel that um, I've seen patients that respond quicker even with uh, suppository um, center enema. Uh, center enema, which is just saline. Yeah, and not the uh, not plate enema because you know the plate enema you take caution, especially patients with uh, renal failure, because we're worried about the high phosphate content. So I find that this liquid based kind of suppository are even faster in uh, clearing bowels. Yeah, Thank and you I think so much. I hmm. think I missed one question. Sorry, I just yes, I think there was one about how do you persuade uh, patients, patients who are hesitant to take uh, for shortness of breath despite hmm. multiple explanations. <laughs> I thought you had a very detailed slide about what are all the um, misconceptions that yeah. can... Stop change, this is a very good question because we also commonly encounter um, uh, uh, this, this, this problem. So I feel that um, I think it's okay. I think we have to learn to accept that different of our patients have different values and uh, preferences. So as long as I let my patient know that there is a medication on standby that can be used or that we can prescribe if you feel that your breathlessness is unbearable. So I think it's always being there for them. And, um, and uh, we, we are aware that these patients are at risk of a breathlessness um, issue, have identified it, but if they're not keen, we still try our best to address their concerns. Despite multiple explanations, we cannot, we respect them. And we let them know that it's okay, I hear you but I will have this medication on standby and when you're feeling very breathless and you're ready for it, you let me know, I can prescribe for you. So I think it's letting them know that you'll be here for them and seeing them, observing them and that when they're ready for it, you prescribe it. If not, another way is that sometimes they're opiate phobic, they might be opiate phobic towards morphine. You can see whether you have alternatives or so on. Yeah. Great. So with that, I think we have come to the end. We can see how um, a very thorough and kind uh, Dr. Chum is as a palliative care physician who answers every question and has thought of you know, many uh, different ways to support the patient's needs, lah, even when they are you know, uh, having different values and insistent on certain uh, things. So thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, also want to encourage you to join us again uh, in a month's time uh, in October, uh, in September for uh, uh, the part four of this series of webinar and, and to, year, to calendar mark your 11th of November also for our face-to-face -face CME. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cham and uh, everyone here for joining us. See you next month. Thank you so bye much bye. for this opportunity. Bye-bye. Have a good Thanks. day. Thank you. Bye-bye.